Okay, this little mini lecture is going to be on protists. Uh, the objective of today's lecture, what are they? Structure, how they function, diversity, um, human and plant pathogens, and then the benefits of protists. So usually when you have an organism that doesn't fit into either the kingdom animalia, fungi, or plantae, they throw them in as protists. And originally, they, they were categorized in the kingdom protista, but due to uh, DNA and new sequencing, um, we've actually reclassified them into different supergroups, which I'll go over when we go over diversity. They can be unicellular or um, multicellular, depending on what they are. So if you guys take a look here, get my pen out. So here we have um, trypanosoma, which is African sleeping sickness, single cellular, and these are blood cells here, and this is the actual protist. And here we have kelp, which is multicellular. Um, they can be aquatic, they can be terrestrial, they can be parasitic. Okay. All right, we're going to move on to the next slide. So stemming off of what I said before, because they do not fit into the criteria for animalia, fungi, plantae, they were all classified into this one kingdom, protista, which then changed. Um, many of their characteristics um, are not very common among all of them, because it's kind of just a, a big grouping of different organisms. Okay, For the single cell, so we have here, okay, this is your paramecium, and you can actually see you have different organelles visible inside the paramecium. On the outside, you have something called a pellicle, and that's this ring right here. And it actually acts like a coat of armor. It prevents um, the protist from being pierced or um, hurt. It's, a, it's a, like a cell membrane, sort of, for the actual organism. You can have organisms that have flagella. So if we take a look down here, you can't really see them. But there are these hair-like structures that will span off. There's also one whips out like that. Okay, so this is the flagella. Okay, and it just acts as a whip-like motion. You also have, if we go back here onto our paramecium, we have these little hairs. And these are called cilia. And again, that helps it move around. Now, if we had our amoeba, and I showed you guys a picture of that earlier, so this is our amoeba, uh, just a blob with some organelles. And right here you have the pseudopodia. And the pseudopodia I'll go into a little bit more detail. Basically what it's going to do is it's going to help move the organism through um, the water, usually on a substrate, so if it's on a, a leaf or on the ground. Oops, get my pen back. So it's going to help it move across the ground. And it's going to move these arm like projections out. Okay. It's also going to help it eat. Back. All right. So, one thing I also wanted to mention um, how protists obtain energy. So, you can either have a protist that is photosynthetic, and so we have two examples here. These two are green, and because they contain chlorophyll, so they are photosynthetic protists, and they contain chlorophyll. Or you have other organisms, such as paramecium, and this one here, and so if you can you know, kind of outline it, it actually branches off onto these here, the 
actually they look like plants, but they're not. These are cyanobacteria. We talked about those earlier. So it branches off the cyanobacteria and it has these little cilia that capture food. And these would be considered heterotrophs. So you have your autotrophs, which are photosynthetic, and you have your heterotrophs, which are feeding off of other organisms. Now here, we have our amoeba again. I took this picture a couple years ago. And again, you can see all the different organelles. My pen working again. And it's going to send out the pseudopod, the pseudopodia, which is this false foot. And let's say there's a piece of food right here. It's actually going to engulf that food particle. So this false foot's going to go this way, and this false foot's going to go that way. And it's actually going to engulf the food particle, and that's phagocytosis. And you guys read about that last week. Now, some of the protists, um, they either reproduce asexually through binary fission, and you also have um, protists that produce, reproduce sexually through meiosis and fertilization. Um, I won't go into too much of the details, but just understand that there is either asexual or sexual reproduction. Okay, so if you take a look here, due to the advance of DNA sequencing, we have been able to group our protists into these main subgroups. Originally, there were six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, and then over the years, they've actually become more condensed. And so you have your Escavata. Let's move this pen. That's stayed the same. However, within the last couple of years, they have merged these two supergroups together and called this SAR. Acroplastida has stayed the same. And then the Amoebozoa and the Epithocanata have merged into Uniconta. You're probably familiar with some of these. Um, your euglenozoans, these ones here, it's at the very top. Okay, we're gonna um, see examples of those hopefully in pond water, but those are your photosynthetic dinoflagellates, your ciliates, your diatoms. These here, um, your ciliates are your Paramecium, diatoms, we'll talk a little bit about towards the end of this mini lecture, and dinoflagellates, these are what cause red tide, if you've ever heard of red tide before. Forearms, radiolarians, these are the ones you're going to find in seawater. Now, your algaes are actually protists. So these ones here, your golden algae and your brown algae. Um, and then also your green algae down here and your red algae. So <coughs> they do separate out the different algaes into different supergroups. But many times people think of algae as plants, and they're, they're definitely not. Same thing as when people say blue-green algae in Lake Massasoit, they're actually talking about bacteria. So just remember that your algae, these are your um, multicellular protists. Okay. And you can see that they fall within the same supergroup as land plants. And then at the bottom here, we have our chronoflagellates and our fungi. And we're going to talk a little bit about fungi um, later on. You guys are going to watch a video about it online. Okay, so you have particular protists um, that are parasitic. They're going to survive off of other organisms. Um, we'll talk about four different species. The first one we have 
is here. And this is the genus Plasmodium. Um, you probably know it more as um, malaria. Okay, and so this one specifically infects a mosquito, which then bites a vertebrate to complete its life cycle. Um, it develops in the liver cells, infects our red blood cells. So these here are red blood cells, and then this here right here is going to be your protist. And this is more common in Africa, in African children, affecting around 1 million deaths. Um, this was back in 2010, so a little bit um, some time ago. Um, and it's actually related to uh, sickle cell anemia. And so if you have somebody who is, um, is a carrier for sickle cell anemia, um, sickle cell anemia is a genetic trait. And so if you have somebody who's a carrier, and we'll go a little bit more into this when we talk about genetics, um, they are actually less prone to get malaria. Or if there's someone actually has sickle cell anemia, so this person would have sickle cell, this person is a carrier, then they are less likely to get malaria um, as opposed to somebody who is not. It's just... Um, nature's way of defending itself against this um, POTUS. The next one we're going to talk about is caused by the parasite Trypanosome bussi, and this common name is the African sleeping sickness. Um, it basically causes the human immune system to shut down. It creates this thick layer of glycoproteins every time it has a cycle and the body does create a defense um, to fight against it but because it's, um, it's able to create thousands of different types of antigens um, and it's able to switch to different types of glycoprotein coatings the body has a hard way of protecting itself against this and so it usually leads to death um, and destroys somebody's nervous system. All right, this third one we're going to look at, this one down here. So if we take a look at this one down here, this one is toxoplasmosis. And this one you can actually find in the fecal matter from cats. And specifically, if you are pregnant, you are told not to clean out litter boxes or not to play, um, not to garden, not to be outside um, with your hands in the dirt due to this specific parasite. It does cause birth defects. Again, another blood-related um, protist. And then our last one is a plant parasite. And so there are a couple of different plant parasites. Um, you have some that cause um, a mildew on the plant. Great plants get this a lot. It covers this mildew with the leaves. And the most common one, the most famous one, I have a picture of here, is what's caused the potato blight, the potato famine. And so this potato blight, um, specifically from the protus phytoflora, phytothora, sorry, um, it causes the potato stalks to actually create this black slime. Um, it was back for the Irish potato famine back in the 19th century, a very long time ago, and it wiped out nearly 70% of crops between the United States to Russia. So this is what people remember the, re the most. But not all protists are bad. So you do have some protists that are parasitic, and then you have some protists that are non-parasitic, and then you have some protists that are actually very beneficial to us. <coughs> Excuse me. And so the last one I want to talk about, here we have our corals. And so a 
coral, here, if you actually get my pen, here, imagine when you take a look at the coral, and this is a coral right here, um, I think this is part of the Great Barrier Reef, um, if you were to look inside the very little tiny holes of the coral, you actually have these things called polyps, and within the polyps you have zooxanthellae, okay, and zooxanthellae actually have a symbiotic relationship with the polyp, um, and the zooxanthellae is a type of dinoflagellate, so it has this um, this symbiotic relationship in which it helps the coral process food. Um, without the zooxanthellae, when that actually dies off, you your polyps die, and you're left with this calcium carbonate um, skeleton, which then eventually turns your corals white. And this is what is actually the bleaching. Down here, and we mentioned these before, these are diatoms. They're made out of silica. Uh, we're actually going to see a slide of those. And they are very abrasive due to the silica, and they used to be used in your toothpaste. So that abrasiveness is what is rubbing away at your teeth in order to get off all that bacteria. And then here we have seaweed. And so I know if, if you like sushi, you're eating the seaweed, the kelp, or the other different types of seaweed that they use for sushi. Okay, so protists are also edible. Um, you also have protists, and I didn't draw the... Um, supply picture, but I can kind of draw it up here. So, this is going to be my termite. And so, inside of the termite, you have special bacteria, also found in cockroaches as well, wood-eating cockroaches, but they actually, when the, sorry, this is a log, when you have your termite eating away at the log, all that bits and pieces is going down into its digestive tract. And you have these protists that actually live inside, and they're going to help digest the cellulose that are ingested by these termites, which is always good. Um, the last type of protist that I did want to talk about, and I don't have a slide for it, um, they're called saprobes. And they also feed on dead organisms and waste materials. And they're, they're specialized to absorb nutrients from non-living organic matter. Okay, so you have either dead animals or algae. And the saprobic protists have, are specialized in returning all these org inorganic nutrients into the water and into the soil. And so this one we talk about. Trophic levels, this is very important. So we have here our trophic levels, right? We have our decomposers. I'm going to talk about those later. Um, this is what's going to allow that process for new plant growth, and it's going to help other organisms along the food chain going up. Okay. Okay, and that is it for my mini lecture. If you have any questions, please let me know. Please email me or ask me in lecture.